Good evening. Welcome to Maundy Thursday as we celebrate together the wonder of Christ's love in the man manner in which he served, uh, in the gracious love that was poured out for one and for all. As we gather together tonight at this continuation of our At Table with Jesus, we will focus, as is Monday Thursday, on the gift and the commandment to love one another. Hence, we have the bowl, uh, the pitcher, and we have uh, the towel representing Jesus' washing of the disciples' feet. It's a little strange tonight in that we can't do communion as we always do on Monday Thursdays. Uh, because we are in isolation and we're not able to be together. And my hope and my prayer is simply that in the absence of being able to do the community meal, by its very absence, we are made more aware of how precious that gift really is. And so our focus tonight is less on the meal and more on the message of Christ and his command to love one another. As we long for the day we can come together as a community of faith, uh, present one to another to share this gift of Christ's love. So I begin this evening with the traditional Maundy Thursday instruction. In this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil. All those things that keep us from loving God and loving one another. So we might add in this year the coronavirus. But this is the struggle to which we were committed in our very baptism, where God's forgiveness and the power of his spirit to mend our lives continue with us because of his love for us in Jesus, our Savior. It is within the community of his church that God never wearies of giving peace and new life. And in the words of absolution, we receive forgiveness as from God himself. This absolution we should not doubt, but firmly believe and therefore have our sins forgiven before God in heaven, for it comes to us always in the name and by the command of our Lord. So we who receive God's love in Jesus Christ are called to love one another, to be servants to each other, just as Jesus became our servant. It is also then in the gift of Holy Communion that the members of the body of Christ participate most intimately in the gift of his love. So we remember our Lord's Last Supper with his disciples, where we too are invited to eat the bread and share the cup of his meal. Together we receive God's gift. We participate in the new covenant that makes us one in Jesus. So the promise of that meal is the promise of the great banquet that we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns in the culmination of our reconciliation both with God and with each other. Welcome to the table. Time. Now, now is the day, the day of salvation. salvation. 
Turn us again, O God of our salvation, that the light of your face may shine on us. May your justice shine like the sun, and may the poor be lifted up. Jesus invites us once again to come to the table of mercy. May we find nourishment at the table with you. Let us pray. O God, you give us your Son, who invites all to come to the table. Nourish our lives through the gift of your gracious love. Open our eyes to see the wonder of this journey with you. Help us to hear and respond to your invitation to walk closely with you and with our neighbor. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and shine within your people here.
Gospel for this Maundy Thursday is found in St. John, the 13th chapter. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of his Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. He knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, Are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not now realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. But Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Well then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. Now when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. And now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that you should do even as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And so, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Instead, a new commandment I give to you, to love 
one another as I have loved you, so it is that you must love one another. And by this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you this day from our God of love and from the one who invites us to the table, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When my three kids were little, we spent a lot of time, and I mean a lot of time, in the van running from one thing to the next. From dance to football to basketball and church, hockey, school activities, baseball, there was always something that we had to do, somewhere that we had to go. Now, my husband Ron worked evenings, and because we were on the road a lot, it meant we ate out a lot, especially at McDonald's, and we often ate in the van. I remember one day that we had a rare occasion to be home, and I called outside to the kids that it was time for supper. They all ran and got into the van. Though it was funny, I also recognized that it was a sad commentary about how we were sharing our meals together. Meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner, brunch, holidays, meals are such an important part of our lives. No matter where you go in the world, meals play a central role in the culture of a community. In our society, far too often our meals have been eaten alone, standing up or driving in the car. But with this unprecedented time in our history, mealtime has once again become an important focal point of the day, a time to pause, if you can, to gather together with loved ones, to savor the tastes and the smells of the foods that we are eating. Even in this time of isolation, people are using technology to gather together to indulge in conversation and community with others over meals. Sharing meals is one of the most uniquely human things that we do. No other creature consumes food at table. And sharing tables with other people reminds us that there is more to food than just fuel. We don't eat only for sustenance. To eat together is not just about food and nutrition. It is about educating and teaching others how to become members of a society and culture, about building relationships. Over a family meal, kids learn how to conduct conversations, observe good manners, serve others, listen, solve conflicts, and compromise. Studies have shown that children who eat at least five times a week with their family are at lower risk of developing poor eating habits, suffering with weight problems, or alcohol and substance dependencies, and they tend to perform better academically than their peers who frequently eat alone or away from their families. The National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse studied ways to keep kids from destructive behaviors and found that it was family dinners that were more important even than church attendance and more important than their grades in school. Meals are a powerful expression of welcome and friendship in every culture. It's not a coincidence that the most successful peace talks among nations happen over a meal. When we pause and share food with another human being, it can reshape our views of that person and of their culture. Eating together is an experience that ties together cultures and develops friendships. It breaks down barriers and can act as a catalyst for connection. Jesus understood this, and Luke did as well. One of the distinctive elements of Luke's gospel from all of the other gospels is its emphasis on meals. New Testament scholar Robert Karras says, in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. 
so much so that Jesus' enemies accuse him of being a glutton and a drunkard, someone who eats too much and drinks too much. There are 19 meals that are recorded in the Gospel of St. Luke, 13 of which are unique to his Gospel. Gordon Smith suggests in his book, A Holy Meal, The Lord's Supper and the Life of the Church, eating was for Jesus a key means by which he proclaimed the coming of God's reign and acted or enacted its arrival. This is why Jesus' meals are so significant, because they embody God's grace and enact God's mission. They were meant to illustrate a new social order, a new way of seeing the world. The Jesus of Luke's gospel is one who seeks to include not only those who have been previously excluded because of who they were, those whose race, religion, gender, or age had kept them on the outside, but also those who were excluded because of what they had done. Again and again, Luke's Jesus reaches out to bring in those who were left out, those of low status, a category which included women as well as the poor, the sick and crippled, the lame, those who were ritually unclean, sinners, and outcasts. Luke emphasizes more than any other gospel Jesus' association with those who were on the fringes of society. Today, Monday, Thursday, is the day that we remember perhaps the most significant meal that Jesus ever ate, his last meal on earth. The meal that has become known to Christians around the world as the Last Supper. It was a special meal not only because it was Jesus' last, but also because it was a Seder meal, a Passover meal, which is probably the most important meal that Jews share together throughout the year. It is a meal that Jews celebrate to remind them of their deliverance from Egypt, of God's faithfulness, God's love, and promises. The meal takes a lot of planning, much preparation, and it typically lasts for hours. We heard in our reading that Jesus sent Peter and John into the city to secure a place to celebrate this important meal and to make the necessary preparations for it. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him, and he wanted to have one last opportunity to sit and break bread with those he loved. At that meal, Jesus had an important message for his followers. While they argue, argued over who was the greatest among them, Jesus wanted them to understand that their role was to become like those who were the least. Jesus tells his disciples, but I am among you as one who serves. Though Luke doesn't talk about it in his gospel, Jesus actually showed his disciples the meaning of servanthood when he took on the role of servant by bending down and washing their feet. It wasn't an easy lesson for them. In all of these meals, Jesus brought a new understanding to the meaning of God's kingdom. In all these meals, we see what Jesus wants us to do. We see that the table is a place where everyone even those who are broken and marginalized can find true connection and belonging. You see, Jesus' table is a place where we can all come and find that we are truly loved and accepted unconditionally. As we come and are fed with the body and blood of Christ, we are strengthened to be the ones who are welcoming to those who just don't fit in. We are nourished to speak a word of grace and acceptance to those who are different than we are. The Lord's table encourages us to be the ones who reach out and invite in the lonely, the homeless, the sick, the suffering, the refugees, and the poor. In the Holy Meal, we are fed so that we can go into the world and be a voice of justice and compassion, 
working toward a world where there are no insiders and outsiders, working as servants in God's name. Though we cannot physically come together today to share this holy sacrament, I want to remind you of the words that you hear when we do share this sacred meal at Jesus' table, given and shed for you, for you. May you hear these words today not only for yourself, but may you also hear in them Jesus' call to continue his work. Even in this time of separation, we are still called to care for others, to feed and serve them in whatever ways we can, that all may know the life-giving, unconditional love of our gracious God. Dear friends, in these coming days of uncertainty, each time you sit down for a meal, may each bite remind you of God's unconditional love, God's sacred promises, and God's eternal presence. Amen.
life. Give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our